for those of you who don't know, I'm the youth pastor here, so I oversee middle school, high school, college, as well as the internship program at our church, and, uh, and I, I love, I just love young people, and it's just what my passion is, and so uh, I get that great honor of working here and doing that. My dad is, uh, my, my parents are the lead pastors here at New Vintage Church, and my, my, my dad is off in Arizona right now. Uh, preaching in Scottsdale, Arizona, and so he sends his blessing and prayers. He was praying for you guys this morning. He te- was texting me, and, and I told him I was praying for him. And so uh, if it's your first time here, just know that if you don't like me, come back and check him out, okay? But uh, it's a little nervous. I mean, I just try to keep, you know, the water running while he's gone. And so anyways, I, I have the awesome privilege of preaching to you this morning, and uh, I got a message that's really heavy on my heart. You ever, had, you ever feel like you had to tell somebody something, like you just, you knew something? That's how I feel. I feel like I know something this morning that i got to share with you that the Spirit of God has been uh, really pushing me towards uh, in the Scripture. And so uh, we're going to look at Luke uh, 10 this morning. Luke 10, if you've got a Bible, Luke 10, verse 25. And the title of my message today is The Journey. The Journey. Luke 10, verse 25. Luke 10, verse 25. It's up on the screen. If you don't have a Bible... You're lucky. I gave you a Bible. Here we go. Luke 10, 25, it says this. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is it written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, You shall love the Lord God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, I got another question for you. Okay, so who is my neighbor? And Jesus replied with a story. Jesus doesn't really do uh, yes or no answers. He kind of explains it in questions and stories. And Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Not by chance, I love that with Jesus, just by sheer luck, okay, uh, a, a priest was going down the road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, I love that phrase, as he was on a journey, he came to where he was, When he saw him, and he had compassion, he went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay him when you you come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? And he said to the one who showed mercy. It's interesting because Jews and Samaritans uh, there was racial tension there, okay? They were not friends at all. And so it's interesting that at the end of the story, Jesus asks him this question, who was the neighbor? And the man doesn't even say the Samaritan. He just says the one who showed mercy. And so it's interesting how this is unfolding. And Jesus said to him at the end, you go, you go, and you do likewise. You go, and you do likewise. I want to talk about what journey you're on this morning. And hopefully I can remind some people in here of the journey we're truly on. And Jesus said this. Check this out. Jesus said his followers will be known by one thing. It's not how they dress. It's not how they pray. It's not what church they go to. It's not their membership or their baptism. It's how they love one another. That's pretty uh, pretty deep, Jesus. Jesus. So I, I want to talk about that journey this morning and hopefully challenge you and uh, remind you of really what we're uh, called to do. So let me, let's pray real quick before this message and we'll dive right in. Lord, I thank you so much for every person here. God, I just thank you for your word. It's a light into our path, a lamp into our feet. God, we ask that you would speak to us this morning. And Lord, help me to make sense. In Jesus' name, somebody said amen to that. Okay. Have you ever had a big uh, event that was on your calendar that was just a big one, like it, it's a non-negotiable, it was like a wedding 
or it was a big party for a friend, or, you know, maybe it was a baby shower. But whatever it is, it was a big event, you know, you could not miss. And you're almost stressed out just thinking about it. You got it in your calendar months in advance, and, and you know that it's on this date. Nothing else can happen on that date. And uh, it's, it's a big thing coming up. And so I, I had a buddy who I was friends with in high school, and he was dating this girl his senior year of high school. And they dated for two years after high school, and then they got engaged, and they got married. And so he told me I was going to be in the wedding, and I was super excited. You know, I was going to be a groomsman in one of my best friend's wedding from high school. This is so cool. And so he, you know, he had me come over a few months before the wedding, and, and, and he had me try on the different clothes that we were going to uh, wear in the, in the wedding. And so I'm trying on the clothes. They fit good, and they look good. And all this stuff. He says, okay, you have one job, though. You have to go, and you have to, he sends me a picture. You have to get these kind of brown leather shoes. I don't I don't have these. This is what the groomsmen have to get. You have to get these, this color. Okay, I don't really care as much the shape, but it has to be this color. It has to be like a low top brown leather shoe. And I'm like, I got this. That won't be that hard. Those are very popular. You know, you can find those in a lot of places. Well, months go by, and it's about a week before the wedding, and I remember I got to go get the shoes. So I go to the mall, and I get the shoes, all right? And, you know, I, 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 I spent not a ton of money, but they were not like just, you know, $20 shoes or brown leather shoes. So I get the shoes, I take them to the house, and I am ecstatic for my friend who's going to get married. I'm so excited because, you know, I've been, we've been looking forward to this day. He's one of my best friends in the world. He actually grew up in a different religion, and God saved him when he was a senior in high school. And we would just meet at Starbucks at like 9 p.m. every night talking about the Bible. And so we're just very close. We have that connection. So... The wedding day comes, and I'm a little stressed out. I think this was the first time I was ever a groomsman in a wedding. I want my hair to look good. I want my facial hair to look okay. I want, you know, I just, I want to make sure that I don't forget anything. I want to make sure I get the vest, that I get the tie, that the shirt looks good, and it's ironed, and it's ready to go. It's on the hanger, right, that I got good dress socks. Okay, I'm just making sure. I'm so consumed with the thought of this wedding, I do not want to miss it. It's been on my calendar. I'm waiting for it. I got the date memorized. I'm, I'm so excited to be in this wedding. I go to the wedding. It's about 50 minutes from Tri-Cities. The wedding place is right outside of Walla Walla. It's just less than an hour away. I get to the wedding venue. You know, I'm hours ahead of, you know, ahead of the ceremony time because we're going to take pictures. I look down, and I'm wearing these old three-year-old Nike shoes that I mow the lawn in. <laughs> and I forgot the brown leather shoes. Probably the most important part of this outfit. One, because I spent money on those and I didn't have to spend money on anything else. And secondly, he told me, the one thing you must get and bring, the one thing, was brown leather shoes. He even gave me a picture to go by. And I am wearing these ripped apart and they're stained green from mowing grass, and they're absolute. They smell heavenly, I'm sure, and they're absolutely horrible. And I totally forgot to get the shoes. Have you ever been so consumed with where you were going, you actually missed the most important thing? On the way. Have you ever gone to a place that you were meeting somebody for coffee or dinner or something like that and you forgot your wallet? How do you forget? It's because you're so consumed with the idea of you're going somewhere that you forget to do the things you have to do along the way to, to, in order for the journey to work. Here's my thing this morning. Here's what I want to work from. All of us are on a journey. All of us are. All of us are on a journey with God. Here's the issue. Sometimes we get so focused on our journey that we miss people along the way that God has put on our path to love and to help and to look for and rescue that really our Christianity only comes, becomes about my journey and my path and my road and where I'm going. And it's this horrible spiritual disease I call meism, where you think your journey is more important than the people you encounter on that journey. We can get so caught up in, I want to be a better Christian, I want to be a better spouse, I want to be a better parent, I want to be a better friend, that we forget that God is sending people on our path on this journey and that God is wanting us to stop maybe and not pass by so many of them. God is wanting us to live for the people. I, I, uh, I'm going to be really honest with you this morning. I would rather wait till an NBC outreach to help somebody. <laughs> I would rather wait till we do the kids' candy carnival to say 
to, to, to help somebody or to pray with them. I would rather pray for somebody in the privacy of my own home. Lord, bless them. Jesus, just help them. I would rather do that than actually stop what I'm doing on a day and actually help somebody. It's interesting because the pastor, yeah, my breed, they see the guy, and you know what they do? They go on the other side. And they kind of walk by. And then the Levite, who is an another religious leader, he sees the man. Oh, and he does the same thing. And here comes a Samaritan. The Samaritan. And they get down the ground and they actually help this man. It's incredible. I wonder if there's been people that we've passed by that God's put on our journey that he intended for us to stop to help. But we were so busy going somewhere that we forgot to help someone along the way. And love, just so you know, love is really important to God. In fact, Jesus said this. You don't believe me? Check this out. Jesus says, here's the most important commandments. Love God with all your heart, mind, soul, strength. And then he says this. Here's what's equally as important. Now, let's just stop for a second. If anything is equal as loving God, it better be an important thing. Because loving God is pretty big. It's a pretty big deal to God that you love him. It's the most important thing. Thing. So if there's something as equal to loving God, I want to know what it is. And here's what Jesus says in the book of Matthew chapter 22. He says, I give you a commandment. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And this is equally as important to love your neighbor as yourself. It is equally as important as loving God. Our faith is not just vertical. It is also horizontal. I, listen, I, I, I believe that faith or that love is not about your intentions. It's about your actions. That loving people actually requires us to live a different way. It actually requires us to pull out our wallets sometimes. It actually requires us to invite somebody to church and get past our fear of uncomfortability and rejection. It actually requires us to stop what we're doing and to look around and to pray and to go and to seek and to search. I believe that love has nothing to do with how you view somebody. Love has to do with how you treat somebody, how you help somebody, how you help them when they're in their worst moments. Jesus is describing here what perfect love looks like. When you're on your journey, God will send people on your path. And they're specifically there not to bug you, but so that you could love them. Here's the interesting thing. When we pass by on the other side, we think it's because we're protecting ourselves when we're actually restricting ourselves. Restricting ourselves from doing what God asked us to do. The same bricks you use to build up to keep people out are the same bricks that will keep you prisoned from doing God's will for your life. I believe that God this morning is wanting us to, uh, to love, to love a lot. There's a story in the Bible of this paralytic man, and he wants to get to Jesus to get healed. And so these four guys take it upon themselves to take the paralytic, and they're going to take the paralytic, and, they, and, and the house is just packed full because Jesus was a good preacher. And the, and the house is packed full of people. It says, it literally says it's standing room only, okay. This is bigger than a Justin Bieber concert. And, uh, and so they take the paralytic man, they put him on a mat, they take him on top of the roof, they cut a hole in the roof. These four guys cut a hole in the roof. They lower this man to the bottom. You know what, they're, you know what, you know what they were thinking? We don't care if we hear the message right now. This isn't about us. This is about our friend who can't get there. We can get, you know, you know, it's interesting. We can get that mentality. We can get that mentality. I don't care if I hear the message this morning at church. If somebody needs my seat, they need my seat. Because maybe they're paralyzed in their life right now. And they need God's intervention. See, Christianity can really become about me. In fact, I'm going to be honest with you. My Christianity can and has become about me. Where it's not about me helping people get to Jesus. It's about me just wanting to get more Jesus. But God has called us to love people. If you are not loving people, you're not loving God. 
Jesus said this, when you do it to the least of these. Listen, this is not metaphorical. This is a literal commandment from our risen Savior. He says, when you go out and you love the least of this world, it's like you're doing it to me. And if I want to bless God, I bless his lost children. If I want to give to God, I give to people who are in need. If I want to pray and, 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 and help and, and, and do what God's asked me to do, i got to find people who need that. I wonder sometimes if the reason I have not found people on my path is, one, because I'm not looking, or two, because I'm actually not going where he's asked me to go. God has asked us to be a people on mission. You know, a lot of Christians, myself included, have been MIA, missing in action, not missing in prayer, not missing in Bible reading, not missing in church attendance, not missing in an outreach, not missing in a small group, but missing in action. Missing in the main point of this whole thing. My sister, uh, Abigail, is a, a sleepwalker, okay? And uh, when, when we were growing up, she slept walk a lot. And it was funny because it would be like 9.30, 10 p.m. I'd be in our living room, and my sister would walk out there sleepwalking. Eyes open, breathing fine, but not conscious at all. And she'd go, hey, I thought, <laughs> we need to cast that out. Okay, in Jesus' name. <laughs> I would say, Abby! It would not wake her up. I mean, I was throwing water bottles at her face. No, I'm just kidding. I just, but I was trying to, I, would, I remember I did get water. I would flick it on her. I'm like, Abby, wake up. No, nothing at all. And she would just, uh, and just walk right back to bed. And I'm like, this is a zombie. What is going on? She, I mean, it, it could not wake her up. Now, I'll tell you this much. I'll tell you this much. She looked awake, and she was walking, you know, towards everyone else. But she was not aware at all of what was happening around her. And I just want to say this this morning. I have been spiritually sleepwalking all the time. How many people has God put around us that we have missed? And check this out. We're living the Christian life, but we're missing everything that it's supposed to be about. Everything. Everything that it's supposed to be about. Living on mission for other people. This is what God has called us to. Listen, I, I do not care if I lift my hands, but I don't extend my hands. I don't care if I pray to God, but I'm not praying with other people. I don't care if I'm living right with God, but I'm not helping other people live right with God. God has called me to be a reflection of who he is on this earth. I'm going to tell you right now that if we forget what God has called us to do, this thing will turn into a holy huddle where nobody gets saved, nobody's inviting anybody else, and we gather and sing and praise God. God, but nobody is coming to saving knowledge in our families, our cities, or our schools. And this is what this whole thing about. I will leverage everything I have for other people. It is what God has called us to do. I am not going to take metaphorically what he says literally. Literally, love your neighbor as you love you. That is challenging to me. That is challenging to me. I don't know if I've ever done that. I want to live like Christ lived. I want to live a life of love. Let me just, let me say it like this. Can I, can I just, let me fix maybe a misconception. Spiritual maturity is not gauged by Bible knowledge. Spiritual maturity is not being able to quote something in the original language. Spiritual maturity is gauged by application. Let me show you, let me show you this verse, James chapter 2, real quick. Verse 14 it says this. What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but don't show up by your actions? Can that faith save anyone? Suppose you see a brother or a sister who has no food or clothing, and you say goodbye and have a good day. Stay home and, and eat well, but then you don't give the person any food or clothing. What good does that do? So you see, faith by itself is not enough. Unless it produces good deeds, it's, it is dead and useless. It is dead and useless. That's interesting. That's interesting to me. I, uh, I remember hearing about the story of this kid who, who was at the beach, and there was um, starfish that got washed up from the sh onto the shore, 
from the waves. And there's hundreds of starfish on the sand. Hundreds. And uh, the kid goes up and he takes one of the starfish and he throws it back in the water. He goes, I'm saving your life. Throws it back in the water. He grabs another starfish. You're welcome. Throws it back into the ocean. Grabs another one. You know, God bless you. Throws it into the ocean. This man walks by, sees what's going on, and he says this. He says, uh, he says you know, you can't save all of them. There's hundreds. You can't throw them all in the water. He says, it doesn't matter. And the kid says, it matters to this one. You're welcome. And I remember being told that story, and they said, do for one what you wish you could do for all. I can't make a big impact. I can't, I can't do what you're asking me to do, Austin. I'm not, and God has not called you to change the entire world. He's called you to change your world. Do for one. Think about that. What if we actually did this? What would it look like if there was a church that said, we're going to take this seriously. We're going to do for one, just one, what we wish we, what if we actually said this as a body? What if we actually said this? We're going to love people. We're going to love people and it's going to be our highest priority. What would that look like? I think it would change a city. I think it would change a people. I'm not getting a lot of amens, but I thought that was some, that Jesus said that, not me, so. I get that ball from the alleys. I, uh, I did a, a version of this message um, a while ago at our uh, college age. Uh, we had a college age service um, at like 9 p.m. a few weeks ago because we're crazy. And uh, I had a kid stand up. I had one of the guys stand up. And I said, all right, stand right there. I said, now, nah, you know, you know I play Little League. So um, I said, just stand right there. And I went like this, like I was about to throw him. And he kind of did, he went, whoa, you know. He didn't know how hard the ball was. It's like a squishy, you know. He's such a wimp. But, um, <laughs> and so I had the ball, and I was like, wait. And he kind of did this. And so then I, I had a girl over here, and I said, okay, now. Catch this ball. And, uh, and I, I did this. And, and she puts her hands out. And I said, did you notice something? When you go to throw something at someone, they, they, they kind of get defensive. But when you throw something to someone, they become receptive. Yeah. They want to catch what you're giving to them. Can I just tell you this? That a lot of people want to throw truth at other people. You... And, and, and you, know what, you know what it makes people do? It makes people hate Christianity. Want to know why? Because they do this. I don't, that hurts. But when you throw Jesus to them, when your posture is like this, they are receptive. In fact, there might be some of you today who left church at one point in your life because somebody threw, threw truth at you, they didn't toss it to you. Maybe you're in here today and you left a relationship with God because somebody threw something at you, not to you. Maybe you've been a person in here before, and, and you've not thrown it to them, but at them. And I'm here to tell you this morning that there is a way to share the truth of God in grace and love that will not damage, but it will heal people. It will bring them to the light. It, they will understand what God is trying to say to them. It will change everything. There's a way to do that that is not crippling to people. And I believe with all my heart, I believe, I want to challenge all of you, that God is asking you to do that this morning. Yeah. To do that. Let me just say it like this. People don't need your prayers. I thought that was kind of funny. I thought you'd be like, <gasps> I mean, they need your prayers. But what I mean is they don't need, your prayers do not substitute you actually doing something for somebody. Uh, it, can I, I'm just going to be 100% honest with you. If I walk by you today and I say, hey, I'll pray for you, there's like an 80% chance I'm going to forget. <laughs> when I told that the first time, people really laughed, and you guys are just looking at me with condemnation. <laughs> Good job, Pastor. Okay. I've asked that guy to pray for me like seven times. I probably got one of them in there. So, What I mean is, is that 
I would, I would rather just kind of go, I'll pray for you, than to go, yeah, let me get in the mix and help you. And Jesus' kind of love does not stand back or pass by on the other side. Like I said in James, it doesn't say, hey, you know, hope you sleep well, get some food in you, okay, God bless. That's not what faith is. And it even says, what good is that? What good is that? Church, can I just say, what good is it if we put on Facebook, you know, come to New Vintage Church, but we don't actually go talk to people? What good is it if we praise how good God is and we don't tell somebody? I remember a, a, a youth pastor asking me growing up, he said, Austin, if you had the cure for cancer, would you tell somebody? And I said, yeah, why would I not? He goes, if you had the cure to sin, would you tell somebody? Well, that's a different question. Why? Because there's a lot more, it's a lot more complex. But I believe that God is calling us to let our faith that's inward be pointed outward to touch and reach other people. You can have this back and I will toss it to you, not at you. The lawyer says this. I, lo I, lo I love what he says here. The lawyer says, who is my neighbor? And then check out Jesus' response. He says, who are you going to be a neighbor to? The lawyer says, and the lawyer was not a lawyer as in he would go into judicial settings and settle cases. He was a lawyer of the Mosaic law. He was a religious guy. And so he kind of tries to justify himself. And he says, who really is the person I really got to show love to? Who is my neighbor? And Jesus flips the question and puts the responsibility back on him. He says, who are you going to be a neighbor to? I would like to ask you that same question this morning. It's not, who is your neighbor? It's, who will you be a neighbor to? I'm telling you, if Jesus was here in physical form, I, I, I believe he would grab me by my shirt and says, Austin, I need you to get out there and to love people. I need you to be my hands and my feet. I need you to go and share my love with people. It's going to change people. It's going to change the city. I do not want to be part of a church that is consumed with us and only us and other Christians if they want to join. I do not care. I pray that we have people in here that reek of drugs and alcohol. I pray that we have businesswomen and teachers and lawyers and all nationalities that God would bring in the lost and the helpless and the hopeless. And and you know what? I have not lived that life because it's inconvenient and I'm stuck in my own little Christian life. But I am not going to live that way anymore. I'm telling you that God has called us to go outside of ourselves and to love people. To love them. This is what we will be known by, Jesus says. I know it's a simple message, but listen, you got to hear this this morning. You have to hear this. That God is going to hold you accountable to how you love or don't love people. He's going to hold you accountable to it. That when actually Jesus comes back one day, he's going to look at people. He's going to say, when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me water. When I was naked, you clothed me. And then all these people are going to say the same thing. We never, what are you talking about, Jesus? We didn't see you. And Jesus is going to go, right, when you did it to the least of these, he says, that's doing it to me. And this question popped in my mind. How many times have I left Jesus naked, hungry, and thirsty on this earth? What would happen, though, if we said, my faith should affect other people? If the gospel, the good news of Jesus, if it's not affecting people around you, I think we can tell this by scripture, then it probably hasn't affected you. You ever got in a pool and it's a hot day and you jump in the pool and you get out and you like you wanted to hug, you know, either your kid or your friend or whatever because you wanted to annoy them and get the water on them. If you haven't, you're probably a Christian. I do do that. <laughs> but it's interesting because it's like, it's refreshing, and I just want to get it on somebody else. Listen, when you get God's love on you, it's so refreshing. You want to get it on other people. The only way we can do that, though, is if we embrace them. 
is if we embrace them. Not, hey, good to meet you. <laughs> but if we say, come here and embrace me. Embrace me. I want to tell you one quick story before we end this morning. Um, when I went to Disneyland, I was 12, uh, I think the first time I was 12 years old, I went with my grandparents. They had paid for our trip, and we were so excited they came with us. And they gave us a gift card, me, my brother, and my sister, of $100 for, like, pretty much any of the restaurants and, you know, gift shops within Disneyland. And $100 when you're 12 years old is like, wowza. You know what I'm saying? Like, $100 now, I I'd still would be like, cool, thank you. You know, but when you're 12, it's like, wow, $100, right? So I uh, were walking around Disneyland. After we were there, I think, for a week. And so after we get done at Disneyland, um, they, they checked the balance on my card. I still had $55 left, which is a bummer because we didn't go there for years later, and we were already on our way out of the park, and I had $55 I had not used. I could have bought more stuff. I mean, I could have just done so much more. Instead, I was just kind of really cautious with it and was just really careful with how I was going to spend it. And... Um, and, and I remember thinking, man, I, I could have used all this and done some pretty cool things. And I, I had that thought the other day where, you know, God sometimes will come into your thoughts and he will remind you of something. He reminded me of this story. And I had this thought, I don't want to get to heaven one day and have dreams, potential, prayers I could have prayed, money I could have gave, love I could have extended, I don't want to go to heaven full of pockets of dreams and money and potential and vision and, and things I could have done. I hope that I get to heaven one day. I'm, I'm being serious. I hope I get to heaven poor, broken, naked. You need clothes, take them off my back. You need money, I got a wallet full of it. Okay, listen, I pray that I get to heaven, not with a card, with God saying you could have spent 55 more dollars. I pray I get to heaven saying, Lord, I spent every dime that you gave me. I gave it all away because I know that when I got here, I couldn't take any of it with me. So while I'm here, God, I pray that I pray as much as I can. I pray that I give money as much as I can. I pray that I give time as much as I can. There are people in this city who need what you have. You don't got to be cautious with it. Listen to me. If you give it away, God can provide it if you give it away God can do it again I don't got much yeah but God is a provider and he can give you more in every area of your life I'm not stressed out about it I know my God is in control he is sovereign over all the earth and the heavens he is the creator of it all and if I need something from my father I can ask him again what would it be like if we said, hey, you know what? I know Jesus. I'm going to be like one of those four men who carried the paralytic to Christ. I'm going to bring somebody to church. I'm going to give money to church. Wonder why? Because it's a church. It's a body that's on a mission to see the lost come home. And it will not happen if we sit inside our homes and just say, God bless new vintage. God has called you. Listen, every single one of you to do your part he's not asking for perfection he's asking for participation you don't got to be perfect you might be saying here today you know what Austin I got a lot of dirt in my life I don't care if it's black dirt white dirt yellow dirt or orange dirt because you went to the tanning bed too much okay God can use any type of dirt in fact you're from dirt okay God made you he breathed life into the dirt listen it doesn't matter who you are you may feel like I can only do a small thing have you ever had a one mosquito inside of a tent they can do a lot of damage. Listen, it doesn't matter how big or how small you feel like your life is, God can use it. What you're saying is, God can't use my life. He's not powerful enough. Let me check in here. God used Lazarus, a dead man, for his glory. God used a prostitute. God used tax collectors. God used fishermen. The question this morning for you is, will God use you and it's not up to anybody else but us how that question is answered this morning 
I want to, I, I, I want, I want to say, Lord, I want to love you and I want to love others. And this morning you can do that. Maybe you've walked away from God. Maybe you're not following Jesus in your life. For whatever reason, today, you can come back to him right now. He already paid for it. He bought it. Will you receive it and accept it and believe it? Maybe you're a Christian in here and you feel like my faith has been dead. That James 2 portion that you read, Austin. I feel like my faith hasn't produced action. It hasn't produced a lifestyle. And listen, all you got to do today is you got you to turn to God and say, God, I need your help in this area. And God will. And God will. Live a life of, event, of adventure, of risk, and live a life of love. Live a life that loves people. Come on, amen. Would you stand with me this morning? Would you bow your heads? Would you close your eyes with me? I want to give an invitation this morning. We do this every single, uh, every single week because we believe that God wants to save people. If you're in this place today, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. No one's looking around. I'm going to ask you to raise your hand if you need to come to God. If you need to come to God today, I'm not going to embarrass you. Raising your hand is only just saying, yeah, that's me. Pray for me. If that's you, come on, I see your hand. Anybody else in this place? You say, yep, that's me. I need to come back to Jesus. Come on, that's awesome. Anybody else? Anybody else? That's great. Is there anybody else in this place? Come on. Come on. Praise God. Secondly, you're in this place today, and you just feel like faith might be dead in you. And you really want God to reawaken that faith. And uh, if that was specifically you this morning, would you just lift your hand? I want to pray with you as well. That's you this morning. You feel like your faith has kind of been dried out. But today, you want God to reignite the passion to love people. Come on, that's awesome, that's awesome, that's awesome, that's awesome. Come on, let's pray together, church. Lord, I thank you right now for every single person in this place. Lord, I thank you first for the people who said, yep, Lord, I want to come to you today. We thank you, God, that today is a brand new day for them, that the mercy and the grace of God falls on them. God, that you are for them and you're not against them. That, God, you love them. You have a destiny and a plan and a purpose for their life. I thank you, God, that, Lord, this is just the beginning, not the end for them. And, Lord, I thank you for every person today who lifted their hand across this place. They feel like their faith might be dead, might be stagnant, might be dry. But Lord, today you're going to infuse your passion in our faith again, God. We're going to live a life that's on mission for other people, Lord. We're going to live a life, God, that blesses you by blessing others. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Come on, somebody said amen. Amen.